All right, we'll get started again, uh, everyone. So uh, this is the session seven. This is medical countermeasures. And the first speaker for this session will be uh, Marcus Tesharia. Uh, and Marcus is uh, One Health Perspective, Medications for Human and Animals. And Marcus uh, is a member at Northern Arizona University and the University of Brasilia in Brazil. Welcome, Marcus. Uh, well, first, uh, thank uh, you all uh, for the invitation. It's a big pleasure for me uh, talking a little bit uh, today about coxidiomycosis in Brazil. So the, talk, the title of my talk will be Coxidiomycosis in South America, a rare or a neglected disease entity. So, uh, sorry, let me, okay. So, uh, so today I'm going to uh, present you guys a, some results uh, that we have gotten from a uh, grant that we applied back in 2018, which was defining the epidemiological range of paracoxidromycosis and coxidromycosis in Northeast Brazil. And, um, um, and uh, well, just a second, let me put the, uh, the laser pointer. Okay, and this grant uh, was uh, uh, coordinated by myself, uh, but also uh, has a contribution from Dr. Bodo Vanke, uh, from Fiocruz, Rio de Janeiro, Eduardo Bagali from UNESP, Kelsey Olalio from Federal University of POE, and Bridget Barker from Northern Arizona. And the aims of that grant was to actually produce a retrospective and prospective study of clinical cases of paracoxidromycosis and coxidromycosis in Northeast Brazil. We aim to do a large soil collection from armadillo burrows and molecular detection of both paracoxy and, uh, and coxidioides in those burrows. We aim to uh, do metagenomic studies of positive and negative samples of both species but we also did a predictive modeling of both paracoxy and coxy in this uh, particular region of Brazil. So today I will present more about uh, the clinical data that we have gotten uh, um, from this study. And I really want to actually do, uh, I wish I had more time to actually show the environmental data, but this will be for the coxy study group meeting uh, that will come uh, in a couple months. Um, so, just uh, talking a little bit about coxidiomycosis in Brazil. So, the first case was detected in 1978 in Bahia State. That's here. So, the second case was 1979 in Piauí State. Here, in the third case in Ceará, that was 1989, which is this uh, particular region of Brazil. And in 1991, there was a first outbreak uh, detected there. And that particular outbreak was related to armadillo hunting. Then we found that a second outbreak that was found in Ceará State also do armadillo hunting. And but just 1998, Brazil was recognized as an endemic area, which is very recent, right, uh, uh, of coxidiomycosis. And now, like in, 19, in, in 2018, a third outbreak related to uh, armadillo hunting was detected in Pernambuco State. And this is all about uh, northeastern Brazil. So, and this is not uh, uh, novel because we do know that uh, not only coxy, but also paracoxidioides, they are tight associated with mammalian hosts, particularly with armadillos. So if you go there to where those places that people got sick, we can recover like coccidioides or paracoxy from both the armadillos, but also from the soil and from the burrows, suggesting a tight association of both coccidioides and paracoxy with this particular mammal host. But this is, this is a very interesting uh, paper that was published uh, uh, back in 2012 by Rosana Cordeiro, and that she was looking for histoplasma capsulatum in northeast Brazil. And they, like, trapped the several, like, uh, bat species. Uh, but she never found, actually, histoplasma. But one of those uh, species, which is Carolia pesipilata, which is a frugivore bat, she was able to isolate coccidioides. So this is the colony, and this is the, the isolate producing arthroconidia. These are some histopathology from the lungs. And we can see here endosporulating spherules on that. 
But what is very interesting, too, that was the Glosophica soricina and the, the Desmodo to Rodentus, they also uh, carried, uh, uh, they, were, they were able also to detect antibodies against coccidioides, suggesting that bats also carry coccidioides uh, in northeastern Brazil. This is a very interesting uh, uh, study that was conducted by this group back in 2012. So if we look to the, to, to the endemic areas, uh, of uh, coccidioid mycosis uh, in, 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 in the American continent, we can see here the most, you know, the first, uh, the most endemic area here in the United States and Mexico, but we do see some pockets of endemicity uh, in South America. And this is a very particular area where coccidioid is, is detected in Brazil. And this is the area that we are very interested uh, in do our uh, studies in, in, in Brazil. Correct. So, and, and this area is very particular because it has a very low um, human developed indexes compared to other areas in Brazil. If you can see here, they have very, very low. So a lot of poverty, very um, uh, fragile uh, public health developed in this area. So we got very interested to actually, in, uh, it's very interesting to uh, study this infectious disease in this particular place of Brazil. Not only this, if we look to this a particular area in Brazil where coccyx is endemic, this is a very unique biome, which, which is Caatinga, uh, which is the Brazilian, which is not a, a very savanna, but it's a very uh, extensive dry lands of in the Brazil. And this is very particular because uh, it 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 uh, it ranges from from northern uh, Piauí and Ceará Straits up to like southern Bahia states. And it's a very unique biome. If you see the, uh, the, 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 the ecology and, 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 and the pasture there, it's, it's, it, it feels me, uh, 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 it feels like Sedona, you know, going back to Arizona where I did my postdoc with Bridget, it's a very similar. So a lot of shrublands, it's a very, it, it's characterized by a, a arid to a semi-arid semi area with a lot of cactus and in a very particular uh, biome of Brazil. Um, so we conducted this retrospective study from 1978 to 2021, and we were able to detect 292 cases. So this is a large case series outside the hyperendemic area in North America, in the United States and Mexico. So we were able to find 22 cases in Maranhão and 270 cases in Piauí. So if we see in this map, this is all, all the dots here uh, represent each one of the cases. And we know there are some areas with more cases compared to other ones. So we observe that males, 98% of our uh, 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 population were composed by males, but very like low representative over females. And the mean age was 31 years. So the range was seven to 85. If we can see the ethnicity of the cases, so the majority were black, so 78.4%, so white 20.9%, uh, and we did see some uh, native uh, uh, Indians here, uh, which were also uh, able to uh, get coccidiodomycosis in our case series. So just to represent here, so most of the cases so far diagnosed, they come from this particular state, which is Piauí. Okay, so, and there are a couple like some imported case, for example, in our hospital in, in, in Brasilia, but also in Sao Paulo and Rio Grande do Sul, where they can get coccidiodomycosis and travel to get diagnosed in several other places. But what we can tell here is that Piauí is the state that we have the majority of cases that are uh, diagnosed so far. Okay, so this is the, this is the, uh, uh, the, the, the places that we can get. So it's a lot of shrublands, um, and a very particular, so a lot of cactus species and, 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 and all of that. So it's a very dry land areas, but uh, also some areas with, uh, with some a transient uh, biome to the Amazon forest too. So it's very interesting to see if, if it's only in the very dry uh, pasture, but also in places that we have a lot of babasu palms and, 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 and et cetera. Okay, so... The most shocking uh, information here is that 
266 patients, they have uh, tell to the doctors that they were like hunting armadillos previously where they got sick. So, so if you're hunting armadillo in Brazil, particularly in Northeast Brazil, the chances to get coccidermycosis are very high. So 91% of the patients, they were uh, reporting hunting armadillos prior to doing this. But not only hunting armadillos, but also like agriculture, for example, manioc harvest, which is a very, uh, uh, so a, a, a plant that we do a lot of like uh, arena, you know, we, we do eat a lot of this uh, plant, um, you know, it's a part of the diet of most of Brazilian people. So this is a risk factor too. And others, for example, pond excavation, rock extraction, gardening, soil preparation, etc. If we look to clinical forms, we observe that the most cases were related to acute pulmonary disease, which is very interesting too. Uh, we did observe some disseminated cases. For example, 3.4% uh, of the cases have disseminated infection, but also chronic and regressive cases we have also observed too. So pretty much, so if you can see in this picture here, so when people are like digging uh, 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 on armadillos, which it, it, which this particular uh, species called Dazipus nodensinctus. So it's a very traditional here to eat those uh, animals, not only in Northeast Brazil, but for entire like country, you know, they really dig into the, like their, uh, um, to, to their um, 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 holes and they try to get, extract the armadillos there. But they also uh, use dogs to seek because they can smell it and they can uh, go after the armadillos, which is very interesting too. So when they do and people got sick, not only the, the, the people that are hunting, but also the dogs. This is a dog that was like participating on one of those huntings. They also get pretty sick and, and you know, the God, so dogs are very affected when they are also hunting too. Um, so when you look for the clinical aspects of the disease in Brazil, we can see that pulmonary symptoms is 100%, okay? And cough, fever, and thoracic pain are the most um, clinical symptoms observed in those patients. We have detected not only those three that I have uh, talked before, but with this new case series, we have detected 42 microepidemics, which involve more than two people. Um, so acute pulmonary infection was the most uh, frequent form and 20 days to, uh, and getting like 21 days for resolution. The incubation uh, was, uh, I mean, uh, uh, was about 10 days with, I mean, uh, uh, with a range actually for four to 30 days. We didn't uh, observe any HIV co-infections, but we did see some co-infections with tuberculosis. What is really interesting here in our case series, we don't see much uh, cutaneous hypersensitivity symptoms, which is very observed with uh, coccidiomycosis in both Mexico and the United States. So dissemination, uh, we observed about 5 to 10% of the cases. The resolution was about 90% of the cases, and the deaths was pretty much uh, associated with complications with central nervous system infections, so related to disseminated infections. Okay, If we look to the case series a long time, so we did see uh, um, some um, spikes pretty much in 2004 and from 2015 to 2018. So we started like to investigate a little bit more about what was the environmental or bioclimatic variations that were uh, collaborating with the spikes in, in, in this uh, case, especially in the Piauí state. And we did observe that if we have precipitations like below 100% millimeters, like one year below the cases, we have increased of valley fever case, especially in the PLE state, which is very interesting. So if you, if you look here for the case here along the time, we do observe that we have very low precipitations one year before we have a spike in the case. So, you know, severe drugs are, are uh, tightly related with spike in the case of coccidiomycosis in Brazil. 
Okay, so next we started to do some species modeling, modeling to delimitate the range of coccidioides in this particular area of Brazil, in North East. So we collect both environmental data and clinical data, and we started doing some uh, random forest models to actually to predict where those species are. And so each dot here uh, is re uh, responsible for each one of the cases that were diagnosed. And now we can have a better idea where the disease, where we can predict where the disease is in Brazil. We do have a very uh, pocket with a very significant association with the disease in Northeast Brazil. So this is a good data because we can take this to the public health system and make people more aware about the, where the disease is and, and where we can find most of the cases of coccidioidomycosis in Brazil. Next, we start doing whole genome typing um, um, from the isolates in Brazil. We did sequencing 14 isolates uh, in Brazil. And uh, as, uh, the, uh, as stated before by Matthew Fisher and John Taylor using microsatellites, so the Brazilian uh, strains, they do fit into this well-known Texas, Mexico, South American clade, which uh, is part of the big group of coccidioides Coccidioides posadaceae here, but uh, which is divergent from Venezuela. But what's very interesting here, so if we take the pi measures here, which is, stands for nucleotide diversity, it's very low. So this branch is very clonal, like compared like to the other, for example, to the Phoenix and Arizona groups. Uh, we can see here the difference on the branch size. So if we uh, think that uh, nucleotide diversity and time they are related, so we do see that maybe this population, it's very recent. Not only this, but the pi values are very low compared to Venezuela, suggesting that the colonization of coccidioides posadasi in South America, not only in Brazil, but in, in Venezuela was recent. If, like, nucleotide diversity and time are related, okay? So this is the genotype that we get here uh, in Brazil. If we look to the... Uh, to the population structure of coccidioides posadasi in Brazil, we do see that Venezuela, Arizona, and this big Texas, Mexico, South America, they form, they do form some clusters. And the Brazilian cluster, it's very unrelated to all this one, suggesting that some sort of a bottleneck events occurred during the evolution of coccidioides posadaceae. And uh, I would like to discuss a little bit more because like in Brazil, in, not only in Brazil, but in South America, just like over a thousand cases were described so far since the first case described in Argentina. So what, why we don't see that many cases of coccidioidomycosis in Brazil? So one of the reasons could be demographics. So there are not many people uh, living and doing more uh, um, agriculture and other um, factors uh, in those areas. So are there bioclimatic factors that like make up uh, coccidioidomycosis in Brazil less, uh, in, uh, has less incidence compared to um, uh, Mexico or South America or, or United States, for example? Is there a lack of awareness of diagnostics? We don't know. So are those trains low virulent? So we wanna do some testing to actually to respond to that question. Is the genetic background of the host, for example, uh, associated with this lower incidence or natural phenomena? Because, for example, we don't see many habobs in Brazil, which, it, which we do see a lot in the United States. But actually to, actually to talk about a little bit about lack of awareness, I'm, I'm, I'm really like uh, about to finish my talk, but we... we if we don't have awareness, uh, diagnostic tools, now we do have, because, uh, for example, fungi can cause community acquired pneumonia, so those cases can be, like, confounded with viral and bacteria infections, of course, and, and, and we do know that coccidioides is uh, one case of community acquired pneumonia in Brazil. But, uh, but we didn't have a good test, but now... Uh, we are testing like the sonar lateral flow assay. And as you can see here, so we are validating this test and it's getting very, very promising results. As you can see here, so we are taking those retrospective cases of confirmed uh, coccidioidomycosis case by both mycological or histopathological assays and all of that, they come positive. So we are trying to validate this to actually have a 